Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Greg Smith, Florida Literacy Coalition. Um, welcome. I hope you all had a good evening and welcome back to the second day of our virtual conference. Um, we're happy to present a, I think it's going to be a really interesting session today. I'm happy to present our, our co-presenters today for this session, uh, Cheryl Hernandez who's the executive director of the Kenosha Literacy Council and, and Cassie Christensen, who's their program coordinator. Uh, their program is located in Southern Wisconsin and I had the opportunity to attend one of their sessions at last year's Pro Literacy Conference. And I was very impressed with uh, really interesting stuff that they're, they're doing in Kenosha. Uh, very student centered, um, very results oriented. Um, you know, a really nice mix of, <clears throat> of um, program features that we don't typically find in, in all adult education literacy programs. So really excited to, to learn more about what you all are doing in Kenosha. And of course, that was pre-COVID. So you may have made some adjustments, I'm sure, as all the programs have. So let me turn it over to the two of you. Thanks. Good. Well, thank you, Greg, for that introduction. And thank you all for joining us this morning. We um, hope that you're going to have some great takeaways from this presentation, and we also hope to keep it engaging despite not being able to be together in person. Um, and so one of the ways that we hope um, to be able to do that is we'll have a couple of opportunities to um, answer questions throughout the session. So as Greg mentioned, there's a Q&A feature on the chat box, so please um, post questions there as they come up throughout the presentation. And then, like I said, there'll be a couple times during the presentation where we'll, we'll check in on those. So our workshop focus today is about student persistence and how we can help students increase their persistence so that they're able to meet their goals. And as Greg mentioned, it's really focused on students, right? And how we can help them be more successful. So research shows us that persistence is the foundation that adult learners need to make academic gains that lead to positive outcomes. Unfortunately, as we see every day, most adult learners struggle with persistence for a lot of good reasons. Students stop coming or often miss class because of all kinds of things, unpredictable work schedules, lack of reliable childcare, um, transportation, poor health, the need to care for family members, or just exhaustion from trying to juggle all of those different things. Um, many of these things are beyond their control and certainly beyond our control as a literacy program. Um, but there are ways that we can work to improve their persistence. Uh, it might seem like a difficult challenge, but there are really a lot of things that adult literacy programs like the Kenosha Literacy Council can do, even with limited staff and resources. Uh, so just a little background on our, our organization quick so you guys get a feel for what we do. Um, we're a small literacy council. We have two full-time staff. You've officially met us. <laughs> um, so most all of the rest of the instruction and, and tutoring and program Programming is done by volunteers. So when you talk about limited staff, we've, we've definitely got it. So we serve um, just under 600 students a year and 200 volunteers with two, two staff members. Um, so if we can do this, anybody can. <laughs> uh, we have a video that we think just kind of shows the importance of building community and increasing persistence um, within our own literacy program. And it's kind of um, the focus for our presentation. So if we want to play that video, apart from other literacy councils across the state or even in the region is our real focus on developing community for our learners. We look past um, professional skills or work skills and we recognize that those are really important and we focus on those with programs but we're also connecting them to our Kenosha community and to each other. We're developing a place where they can build a life and build a home for themselves and their families. I remember that when I was in the University of Mexico I was um, Working so, I was working so hard to become a lawyer, and I was so happy about it. But then when I moved to this country, I get a little depressed because it's, it looks like a, all the effort that I put for it was just going to the trash because I couldn't use it here. Well, you don't need to have the skills to speak English because you are going to develop them there. 
It's a good place. Um, you only know go to taking classes. You also uh, have make friends and um, also share your culture with somebody else. So it's a good way to learn English. After having my paralegal certificate, I've been able to get a, a new job in the clarity law. That is a great place to work with. Um, also, I had the opportunity to write um, a book, a children's book. I really appreciate that Miss Dorothy gave me that idea. I really appreciate that time that she was looking for me to, to do something else in my life, not just learning English. She was like a telling me, no, maybe you can do something else with that. Maybe you can be someone else here. So she was like a um, literacy angel for me. <laughs> so that was great. Okay. <clears throat> So just to take a look at our objectives for today and what we hope to help you all learn. Um, again, we're gonna talk about how our organization, the Kenosha Literacy Council, has been able to boost learner persistence and ultimately use that to create student success by intentionally addressing the needs of the adult learners that we serve. And so some of the ways um, that we've done that that we're gonna share with you today is um, to develop an orientation process that ensures student success. Um, how we've established practices, including um, some, we think, innovative attendance policies, proactive communication methods, and student support that promote that learner persistence. Um, how we involve adult learners by creating uh, a student advisory committee that celebrates student successes provides program feedback and mentors our new, newer students. And then ultimately how all of this kind of plays together to create a model for the recruitment and retention of new students that is self-sustaining over time. So hopefully that sounds really exciting to all of you. <laughs> so all of this came um, about when we were introduced to this publication, this study, um, that you can find in your resources uh, from the presentation today. So we shared this PDF with you. Um, the document is called Making It Worth the Stay, Findings from the New England Adult Learner Persistence Project. Um, so it's a fabulous resource. I hope you take the time to kind of look through it. There's lots of great information in there. And um, so again, we're just really quickly summarizing some of the key points from that. Um, but it outlines six drivers of student persistence. So in order for a student to persist, through the program to meet their goals, these six things have to happen uh, within the program. Sense of belonging and community, clarity of purpose, agency, competence, relevance, and stability. And uh, so we're just gonna introduce those um, before we move forward and tell you a little bit about them. So if we wanna do the first poll now, that would be great. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about sense of belonging. So as humans, obviously, we all want to feel welcomed, we all want to feel respected, and to develop that sense of belonging, like we're part of a group. And we are more likely to return to a setting or task when those factors are present. Makes perfect sense, right? <laughs> Building community calls for fostering connections among people, activities, and processes that help students and staff get to know one another and build, and that build trust are really important. Um, so one of the ways that we do this, and Cassie's gonna talk about it a little bit later, is the use of student cohorts or groups of students that can kind of bond and support each other. So let's see how many of you um, responded to the poll that you, you maybe utilize that already. Somewhat, 56%. Well done, guys. <laughs> Hopefully we're gonna give you some ideas this morning to um, increase that, and for those of you who aren't quite doing it yet, um, hopefully we motivate you to give that a try. Um, all right, we can move on to the second poll. And we're gonna talk a bit about clarity of purpose next. There we go. 
So clarity of purpose refers to helping students gain clarity about their own purposes for learning. Um, and so it's really important that this focuses on what their goals and dreams are, um, but also goes in line with what the program's expectations and approaching, approaches to education are. Um, research shows that learners who establish concrete goals are given the opportunity to see that they are making measurable progress towards those goals and then are more likely to persist in their studies. Um, so again, we all know goals are really important and we spend lots of time setting goals with students. I think one of the things that we find is really important at the Literacy Council is to set really um, short term goals to so the students can kind of see more immediate results. So most students come in as I'm sure you all have experience with really big lofty goals, right? I want to learn English so I can go to college and become a doctor eventually. Okay, well, that's going to be a process, right? <laughs> um, so what's, what's something that we can help you with tomorrow or within the next few weeks or within the next few months? So breaking down those big goals into smaller, more manageable goals. Um, so those short-term goals are important. Let's take a look at the poll results to see how many programs feel like they're helping their students set good, good goals. Again, about 50% of you say, yep, yeah, you're somewhat comfortable <laughs> um, with how you help students set and achieve those short-term goals. So again, Cassie's gonna talk a little more um, and hopefully give you some good ideas to improve upon that in the later part of the presentation. So if we wanna do the third poll, and then we're gonna Move on and talk about agency next. So agency is the capacity for humans to make things happen through their own actions. So this is really focused on students. I know sometimes this gets a little confusing um, because as nonprofit organizations, as literacy providers, we might tend to think agency has to do with us our organization, um, but really this is focusing on the individual and the student um, and how they can make their, their reality happen. So research um, on how people learn shows that learners are more motivated when they see the usefulness of what they are learning. And so we do a lot at the Literacy Council to make our programs experiential and hands-on and um, take into account what the learners themselves tell us is important to them and what they want to learn. Let's take a look at those poll results. How well do you feel your program offers diverse learning? I'm excited. I want to hear from some of you guys what all these great programs are. 57% uh, of you say that we do um, somewhat of a great job <laughs> offering diverse learning opportunities. Uh, again, hopefully we can give you some new ideas too. Um, we're going to move on to the next poll and talk about competence. All right, so competence is an adult's belief about their, their competence and how it can have an effect on their persistence and achievement. Obviously, um, when you feel like you are competent, you you can do good things. So such beliefs reflect their self-efficacy. Helping adult learners improve their self-efficacy is a powerful persistence booster and feeds the adults' needs for feeling competent. Students with more self-efficacy are more willing to persist to reach their goals, even in the face of adversity. Um, and people who have high self-efficacy visualize success, whereas those that doubt their efficacy, typically visualize failure. And so we want our students to visualize success, right? <laughs> uh, let's take a look at our poll. <laughs> How well do you feel your program recognizes a wide range of student achievement? 60% are doing um, a somewhat great job of that. That's fabulous. I think one of the things that we really focus on, again, at the Literacy Council is not just the big kind of end of the road accomplishments, but everything in between, right? Everything, every small step as an accomplishment. And we want our students to feel that sense of accomplishment and be motivated by it. So we celebrate lots of, lots of successes. 
All right, we'll move on to the next poll and talk a little bit about relevance. So the degree of perceived relevance of the instructional program, so us, our literacy programs, to the adult learners' goals, interests, and life experiences is a key factor in their motivation to persist in their, stu their studies. Um, so we have to be relevant to them and what they want to learn. It's not what we think is relevant, it's what is relevant to them. Most adult learners are juggling so many different priorities. Um, and those might take precedence if the instructional program doesn't feel meaningful to their needs and interests. So let's look at the poll results. Does your program have a system for addressing student needs uh, for support services outside of the classroom? So this one had um, quite a few, not at all or fewer, somewhat. So this is uh, definitely an area where we can probably give you some new um, ideas to take away from the presentation today. We're gonna do our final poll and talk a little bit about stability. We've all had experiences with this. Learning is obviously difficult in an environment that's chaotic or unstable. Um, thank you for posting the, the last poll. With um, COVID and all of the changes in our, our everyday lives lately, I think a lot of us have uh, experienced this firsthand, right? If you're working from home with kiddos running around <laughs> and uh, lots of interruptions and things, your life is not as stable as it used to be and it's more difficult to get things accomplished. <laughs> um, so many adult learners' lives are marked by instability. Um, oftentimes that's caused by poverty or trauma. Um, and there's not a lot we can do about that a lot of times. So even when we can't change the student's life circumstances outside of school, we can still bring predictable, consistent programming that enables them to participate more, fu um, more fully and with greater ease. Um, so we can create stability for them within our program so that um, when they come here, they know what the expectations are and it's predictable. Uh, so let's take a look at those final poll results. How well do you feel your program institutes an attendance policy that is clear and fair? Oh, lots of, lots of high results there. That's very good. I'm, I'll be interested to hear a little bit more about some of your attendance policies and hopefully we'll give you some new ideas. So um, again, this was just kind of a brief introduction to those six drivers of persistence because we felt like it was really important for you to, to know a little bit about those and have a foundation before we go on. Um, to the rest of the presentation. But this is a good spot to stop and see if there are any questions or comments so far. And maybe Greg can help us with that. And then Cassie, make sure you know you're sharing the screen. <laughs> um, we do not have any questions posted so far. Okay. <clears throat> Right, so we're gonna go on and talk a little bit about um, kind of this journey that we take our students on. And Cassie is gonna help us learn a little bit about that. All right, so um, like Cheryl said, uh, we do break our experiences with the students down into three different parts for this presentation. Um, and we kind of think of it as their journey to success. Um, so the first part is the beginning of the journey. So when a student is uh, first starting their, their journey with us and then on the road is the, the part of a student's experience with us that is probably the longest part of their experience. Um, and then what reaching success looks like. So starting with beginning the journey. Um, so for recruitment, we use a lot of different methods for recruitment of students. Um, obviously, we know that word of mouth is probably the greatest tool that we have, because if we can have learners come through our program and, and we have a, an effective 
um, an effective program for that learner to reach success and they'll go talk to people and bring new learners into us so they kind of advocate for us but we do do other things um, we visit open houses at the beginning of the school year to talk to parents who might be interested in classes we work with our local technical college um, to talk to classes there and uh, maybe get some learners who are looking for additional resources um, and we also communicate our services with different places in the community that might come into contact with people that they can refer to us um, so that might be <clears throat> school counselors it might be the job center um, or other nonprofits that are working with with people in the community um, for intake and assessment so for a student to begin classes with us they need to make an appointment um, and during that appointment, I always assess the student to figure out exactly where they are beginning with us and which level they're going to be in. Um, mm -hmm. And then in addition to that, we start talking about the reason that they want to start learning at the Literacy Council. Um, so this is kind of the beginning of the goal setting process. I get a general idea of what they want to accomplish, and then we can start mixing and matching our different programs to their needs. Um, so not all students will be participating in the same programs. Um, they'll be kind of finding the ones that fit into what they, they need for their specific goals. Um, and then finally, kind of a bigger part of their beginning the journey with us is our orientation process. So every month we hold a orientation um, and it's for every student who has registered within that month. Um, and the orientation really focuses on our student handbook. Um, and then also we dive a lot deeper into goal setting. Um, so our handbook, uh, the students will, will find out what all of our programs are, right? So a description of our programs. Um, they'll also learn about what materials we use at the Literacy Council. Um, and then it also goes through what the expectations are of a student. So um, all of these things were put into the handbook based off of feedback from current students as to what information they think would be good for a new learner to have when starting our program. Um, and during the orientation process, we use a lot of icebreakers and group activities so that students are starting to build cohorts with other learners that are beginning the program. Um, we want them to come to their first class after that orientation and hopefully see a friendly face um, besides me, like because I've met them and I've already started to build a relationship. But if they can build a relationship with another student, um, Hopefully that will keep them coming back even more. Um, and goal setting, uh, we, we focus a lot on goal setting during the orientation. Um, and so by giving the students all of the information about our program, and then also helping them structure a plan to complete their goal, we are putting the students in control of their own learning. Um, so they're the ones that are coming up with their own plan, um, not us. So some of the drivers of persistence that we used here were a sense of belonging with our building of cohorts, our agency, so they, they are taking control of their own learning, um, their clarity of purpose, um, and stability. So clarity of purpose with their, um, their goal setting and then stability with our expectations. Good. I notice there's a few questions now, and um, it might make sense to address those before we move on. So maybe Greg, you can help us out with the questions. Sure. <clears throat> the first question is, uh, how do you assist the students that are beyond uh, ex uh, exited to start class, but fizzle out, excuse me, beyond excited to start class, but fizzle out shortly afterwards? It's like going to the gym, right? You sign up, you get your membership, you're like, yes, I'm going to do this, let's go. And then you go every day the first week, and then the second week you go three days, and then the third week you, well, maybe go once or twice. 
But if you are going with a friend, um, they, you guys can help keep each other motivated. So I think that's definitely part of what we do, right? With that orientation process and connecting them with other students, we're hoping to create those bonds right away um, so that they feel connected um, and part of the group and that helps, they can motivate each other and it helps them want to continue coming. I also think um, creating those clear expectations so they know right from the beginning what exactly your program is and what you are going to expect of them helps them um, continue to come and, and keep that excitement. Also creating goals, right? That process in, in orientation where they create those short-term goals and, and create the process, the steps that they're going to do to achieve those goals helps keep them motivated. Um, I don't know, Cassie, do you have Yeah, I was just going to add on to that, especially with the goal setting, because um, we all have experience with those students who are just ready to, to get going um, and maybe they sign up for every class possible. Um, so having that realistic conversation with them is what kind of time commitment do you really have so that they're, they're not taking on that huge schedule and, and maybe starting off. I'd rather a student start off with one or two classes and build up to getting into four or five classes and signing on to five and then dropping out completely. Uh, Tanya, a few um, additional questions. Does your program have open enrollment? And how long is your orientation and who facilitates it? Sure. I think we're going to talk more about an enrollment in uh, some coming up slides. So we're going to hold off on that question. Um, but the basic answer is yes, we have open and closed enrollment. And Cassie will tell you more about that. Um, how long is orientation and who facilitates it? Our fabulous program coordinator, Cassie, facilitates the orientation. I think it's usually about two and a half hours long. Um, and I think, as she mentioned, we also include our student advisory committee. So there's always um, an experienced student there to talk with the new students as well. Yeah, and our initial intake and assessment is, is about, it takes about a half an hour to 45 minutes, so. Susan and those are two separate things, right? Uh, All right. One, one, so at orientation, are these students going into classes or one-on-one? -on -one? And how do you handle levels of English at orientation? So we, um, again, we're, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but we have many different kinds of programs. We have um, classes, we have small group programming, we have tutoring and one-on-one -on -one kind of tutoring that's more traditional, so we do all of those things. Um, and all of the students, no matter what program they're going into, do this orientation. Um, and how do you handle all levels of English at the orientation? Uh, so all of our programming from the start is done in English at the Literacy Council, and so our orientation is all in English as well. And um, we feel like that's a really important part of the process for the students to know that the expectation is that um, they're going to hear things in English and they're going to be expected to communicate in English. Obviously, for some students, uh, that's really a struggle um, and it's a challenge for us, too, uh, to be able to communicate with them. But Cassie does a great job, um, no matter what their level is, helping make sure that they understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. And I think a, a big part of that, too, is in orientation, you are going to have a lot of different levels of students. And so it's okay if you have higher level students work alongside um, lower level students, because um, that's what we want. We want group work to be done. Um, so we want them to start helping each other right from, right from the get-go, as long as it all stays in English. <laughs> uh, Susan had a question around the level piece too. Do your monthly orientation sessions include learners at multiple levels? So mm -hmm. they get an answer that they do. And are they conducted by level? And do you no, they're not. Okay. So I think Cassie explained that a little bit, right? So. Um, the, there are many different levels in one orientation, and that's actually to our benefit because Cassie can um, kind of pair students. So maybe the um, maybe a higher level student with a lower level student, so they can support each other a little bit. Okay. And she also asked if you have a waiting list. No, we do not have a waiting list. So we um, all of our students begin can begin some kind of programming as soon as they go through that registration process. Um, particular programs, there might be a wait to get into that program depending on when it starts. 
Okay. All right. So I think we're ready to move ahead then. All right. Okay. Um, so we do offer a lot of diverse programming. Um, and before I dive into that, I do want to clarify the difference between our open enrollment and our closed enrollment programs. Um, so our open enrollment programs would, would be programs such as our tutoring um, or maybe a small group conversation class. Um, and these, these programs allow for students to enroll at any time of the year. Um, and it, they also allow for a very flexible schedule. Um, so we have many learners, as I think everybody does, who, they, who have schedules that they just can't commit to a specific day and time. Um, so these classes allow students to pick and choose based on their work schedule for the week. So maybe a student is working an A schedule this week, um, and so they can only come to one class, and then next week they work a B schedule, so they can come to two or three classes. And they can, they can choose that as they go. Um, there's no specific day and time that they need to participate. Um, that's obviously very different than our closed enrollment program. Our closed enrollment programs would be classes that have a lot more structure to them. Um, and they, they would also likely focus on a specific topic. Um, so these classes might include our citizenship classes, um, or our experiential learning classes where they're learning about how to navigate the community. Um, or maybe it's a group of students that have all kind of, they all have the same level and so we have a specific class for them. Um, so that would be a little bit of a difference there. Um, as far as attendance goes for those, we have very different rules for that. So we, we design our closed enrollment programs to take place between six and eight weeks. Um, and we do this for two reasons. Uh, first of all, we know that students who, who are in an open enrollment program, right, they can then begin a closed enrollment program within weeks of registering. So a student might be participating in our tutoring program, um, but they're kind of doing that and then also waiting for a, a citizenship class to open up um, so that they can participate in both at the same time um, or we can get them started and then they can move into closed enrollment programming. Um, and the other reason that we do that is because we want students to have a sense of accomplishment and we know that completing a class within six to eight weeks is a lot easier than taking on a nine month commitment, right? So taking on a class that starts in September and ends in June. Um, and so along with that closed enrollment program, we would have an attendance policy where students would put down an attendance deposit. So they would deposit $20 on the first day of the class. And then when they complete that class, we return that money. Um, and students then have the opportunity to either take that money and, and just leave that program, or they can transfer that balance to another program. Right. Um, um, in addition to the deposit system that we use for closed programming, um, we do have some motivators for our open enrollment programs. Um, we obviously can't do a deposit system because there's no specific beginning and end date. Um, but we do use a reward system. So we've created an attendance punch card and they get a punch on their card every time that they attend class. And once they've filled up that entire card, then we would uh, use that card. It's worth $5 credit towards the purchase of new, new books. Uh, and we found that students have been very excited to get their cards punched. <laughs> so we're glad to see that that's working very well for those open enrollment programs. Um, and, I, and I just want to point out that with the deposit, when students complete a class right, and they find out that they're, what they're learning is directly affecting their daily life, um, they, they're very excited to start the next program uh, or the, put it towards another class. Um, and their attendance becomes a lot more linked 
to the information that they're learning than to that $20 deposit. Um, by the end, I think a lot of the students are like, oh, okay, I, I got my deposit back. <laughs> uh, but in the beginning, it's kind of like that initial motivator to, to keep them coming for the first couple of weeks. Like going to the gym again, right? Like the first couple weeks, it's like, but I paid all that money for the membership. And then you start feeling better and you have more energy and that's what keeps you going. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I just want to give a quick example of, of how this would play out in one of our programs. We have a class um, that focuses on the community. So it's very much so an experiential learning class. Um, and it does run from September to June. Um, but we've taken those nine months and we've broken them down into six different units. Um, and each one of those units is between six to eight weeks. Right? So a student that enrolls in the very first unit, um, so maybe it's schools, learning about the school system, uh, they on the very first day would make their $20 deposit um, with the expectation of finishing the class. Um, we go over a syllabus because in our classes we always have syllabuses so students know exactly what they're going to be learning within those six to eight weeks. Um, and then we also ask for feedback from the students. Um, so we ask them if they have specific questions about that topic or if there is a reason that they were interested in this topic from the beginning so that we can, we have a general plan of what we're going to teach, but then we can modify it to meet the, that group of learners' needs. Um, when they finish that unit, that school's unit, we'll return their deposit, uh, and then they would choose to uh, either keep their deposit or transfer it to the next unit. So maybe the next unit is healthcare, right? So this does two things. One, it gives that student a sense of accomplishment and it puts them in control of their learning so then they can choose to uh, go on to the next unit. Um, and it also allows for new learners to join the class without disrupting uh, current learners. So they can, they can now enroll in that class that does run from September to, to June, but they're not affecting the learners of the learning of students that are already involved in that program. So it's a way for us to get people from our open enrollment programs into a closed enrollment program um, for learners that are able to do so. Um, kind of taking on experiential learning and building cohorts, um, of course, building relationships doesn't just stop with our orientation process. We use, we work on doing that throughout the year. Um, and it's probably one of the most important things that we can do while serving our learners. Um, so uh, just a few things that we do. Uh, so in tutoring, we will do monthly mingling activities. And they're just about 10 to 15 minute activities so that people can meet each other. Because um, we do know that we have new learners coming in there. and they've just completed their orientation process and we want them to be able to meet even more people um, that are uh, in the program. Um, we have break times, which I'm sure most of us do, where we all take break together and we encourage everybody. <laughs> yeah, Pre-COVID, pre-COVID, yes. Um, where we uh, encourage conversation and just kind of catching up with other, other people in our organization. And so that's you know, for all of our teachers and students together to kind of get some chit chat done. Um, and then on top of that, we do a lot of group things um, with both our classes and our, and our, tutoring, and, uh, our tutoring and conversation class people. So we'll do field trips. Uh, it might just be kind of an informal field trip in the community uh, where we can just go for our, uh, the class periods so and maybe to the park to do a scavenger hunt. Um, maybe it's a little bit more organized with a, with a, a local museum. Um, or maybe we do a bigger field trip. So twice, about twice a year, we'll do bigger field trips where we uh, arrange for a bus to take us to a different city. So maybe it's our state capital, Madison, or going to Chicago, which are both within one to two hours. So, um, And then just kind of at the Literacy Council things that we do, is uh, once or twice a month, we organize workshops and family literacy nights. 
Um, so the workshops that we do are designed based on feedback from students. Um, so maybe it's questions they have about topics or um, maybe it's something that we hear is going on in the community. Um, so a quick example of that is COVID before it all kind of went down in March. Um, we had a workshop and we brought in um, medical staff to discuss with our students what coronavirus is and what they should be expecting um, just to kind of put their minds at ease and also give them an opportunity to talk to people in the medical field about their questions and concerns. Um, so by doing that, by using what we know is relevant to them, we're ensuring that they, they will attend. Um, and that's not just for our students, we invite our volunteers to come to that too, because we know that they have a plethora of knowledge to share with our students, um, depending on the topics. Um, so we're helping build relationships through that. And then with our family literacy nights, we're inviting our students to bring their families to the Literacy Council and also our volunteers to bring their families. And we do, um, you know, workshops that focus on on learning about a topic, but we're having a lot of fun doing it. Um, we have a staff person at the Literacy Council who is helping students with uh, challenges that they might be facing outside of the classroom. Um, so this person is called our Literacy Advocate and their responsibility is to connect students to resources that they need uh, outside, of, outside of the classroom. So for example, if a student is having trouble paying their heat bill, the literacy advocate will connect them to the energy assistance program in Kenosha. Um, and the literacy advocate, I just wanna clarify that, is their, their role is to connect the student, but not to do the work for the students. So they're not completing that task for them. Um, they're just helping them get to the right resource. And the reason we do that is because we want to empower the students to be independent and be able to have that um, sense of accomplishment when another task similar comes up. Um, and another good, good reason to have this position is um, we know that our volunteers work very closely with our students and we want our volunteers to know that that's not their role and it's not our organization's role to provide those services, that there are so many other um, great organizations in our community that can take on those challenges. Um, and so our volunteers are, are aware of our literacy advocate, they know our literacy advocate, and they can refer students to that person when a question or concern comes up during class. So that helps take that off the shoulders of our volunteers and they can stay um, they can concentrate on the learning um, that is going on at the literacy council um, so by helping learners take on those challenges that we can't necessarily control a lot of um, we can at least help learners get rid of that that problem right or take on that problem and then come back to the literacy council and really focus on on their goal in their learning um, and finally, for communication, um, of course, we use uh, email and, and the phone to communicate, um, but the greatest tool that we found is Facebook, uh, and we found that it works, re works wonderfully, and the students have told us that that's how they prefer to communicate. Um, so what we've done is we've set up a Facebook group for students, and it's a closed group for students. Um, and this is how we can share new programming with them. We can share upcoming workshops um, or maybe events in the community that they think that we think they'll be interested in um, or resources in the community. And so it's, it's a way for us to, to communicate kind of widely with our learners, um, but it also allows for them to communicate directly with us. So they know that they can Facebook message us if that's what they're comfortable doing, they can call us on Facebook. Um, and, and by doing that, we're, we're helping create that relationship with them. Um, and so they know that we, we are um, 
we care about their goal and their progress and we also want to be a resource for them if they have any questions about things um, maybe their schedule changes and they're not comfortable giving us a phone call uh, but they can send us a Facebook message or it's an easy way for us to reach out and say, hey, uh, you, you weren't in class this last week. Um, we just noticed and we want to check in on you, make sure everything's okay. Um, so we're, we're in, engaged in, in their progress. Yeah. To go along with the Facebook, so we have a main group for the students, but then individual classes um, mm -hmm. and programs sometimes have their own group that's specific to that class too um, and it, I that's a really good way to create those bonds and those cohorts among students so everybody in the book club or everyone in the civics class they have their own group and they can kind of connect with each other and we can post information that's specific to that program um, but they're all part of the, the large student group too <laughs> yep exactly um, and so obviously, as I said, on the road is, is kind of the biggest part of a student's experience with us and all of our drivers of persistence were used here. Um, so I don't know if we want to. Yeah, I think a that, it's a lot of information, right? We gave yeah. you a lot of information just now. Um, so I think this is probably a good time to uh, get some questions again. And if you have questions you haven't posted yet, please feel free. Uh, to put them in the Q&A box because that really makes um, our presentation a little bit more interactive and it allows us to kind of gear things towards what you're interested in learning about. So, um, Greg, if you want to help us out with the questions. Sure. Uh, first question from Dawn, do your students pay for materials? Yes, our students do pay for materials. Um, so there are a few different fees that float around and I think Cassie men mentioned some of them, but um, we have a general registration fee that um, anybody who comes to the program pays one time. So it's just the first time they come to be a student, they pay this registration fee. It's $25, but it's based on their income and their family size as well. Um, so we offer financial aid. So some students pay half of that $25. Some students um, don't pay any of it based on their need. Um, so we never turn a student away because they can't pay any of the fees that we're talking about. We serve everyone that wants to come to our program, um, but we do find that uh, the fees help the students be a little more committed. Um, and so, um, and we're a nonprofit, so, <laughs> so we need a, a little bit of money as well. Um, the students pay for their books, so when they're in a class or tutoring that uses workbooks, they pay for those books. They're generally about $20, um, and they set up payment plans often. Um, so we ask that everybody pay that for their books, even um, if they have a financial need. Um, we still want them to kind of be, be committed and, and pay something towards their books. Um, so we, we very often set up payment plans where they pay maybe a few dollars a week um, or a dollar a week <laughs> until it's paid for. And for the most part, we found that the students really want to be able to do that, right? They want to contribute to their learning and they they don't want things for free. <laughs> um, I think there was a question that goes along with fees, maybe in the chat box. Um, how do they pay the $20 for the deposit? Um, so the students who are in classes pay that deposit that Cassie talked about. Um, we have them pay it in cash, and then we give them that same cash back. Um, and if, if there's a student who can't do that for some reason, then we make, out, make up another arrangement. Okay, uh, Michelle has two questions. You have you uh, have both day and night classes, and how do you deal with students who come late or say that they have to leave early every day to go to work? All right, good question. Uh, so yeah, we have um, all all different kinds of classes: morning, afternoon, evening, weekends. Um, and obviously Cassie works with students in the beginning during their orientation process to choose the classes that make the most sense with their schedule. Um, so if there's a class on Tuesday nights from four to six and the student works every Tuesday <laughs> until five, we're probably gonna say that's not the best choice for you. <laughs> um, and we're gonna work with them to find a program that, that fits their schedule. Obviously, um, Sometimes it's unavoidable. Students maybe have overtime or get called into work. 
Um, and so with the deposit system, the way that it works is, um, and Cassie can kind of chime in here, but they do have, an, they have one time where they can use an excuse. Um, or the one time to miss and still get their deposit back. And so it could be work, it could be that they're not feeling well, it could be that they just, it's a beautiful sunny day and they wanna go play outside with their kids. <laughs> um, but they have one time to miss a class and still get their deposit back. Okay. Uh, what curriculum or books do you use in your classes? Yeah, for, um, we use many different things, like I'm sure all of your programs use many different things. Uh, but for tutoring, the main um, curriculums that we use come from New Readers Press and we use LAWBOK the most often uh, for our tutoring programs. For our classes, it's, um, so for our civics classes and experiential learning classes, they're all things that, um, we've developed ourselves. Okay. Uh, uh, Melissa asked, does your organization cover a city or do you have uh, to cover a wider geographic re range? So we cover our, our county, uh, so the county of Kenosha. Um, it's like the most southern county in the state of Wisconsin, right, right before you get to Illinois and Chicago. Um, so it is a pretty wide area. Um, the city um, where we are is also called Kenosha. <laughs> so we are in the city of Kenosha and the majority of our students come from that um, city area. Um, the county area is a little more rural uh, and we certainly have uh, students and volunteers that come from the county as well. And, and related to that, what is your population? The city is about 100,000. The county uh, 180,000 maybe when you combine them all together. Should probably know that. <laughs> okay. Uh, in terms of your closed classes that are six to eight weeks, do you repeat curriculum or continue on with new learning after each session? It depends on the program. So if it's a citizenship class, it's that class is um, eight weeks long. And so when an eight week session finishes, then we start a new eight week session of the same class, right? The same material. Um, but other classes, so our, we have an experiential learning class called ELL Civics, um, and it follows the traditional school year. So it starts in September and goes through June. But as Cassie said, there's different topics or modules that are 68 weeks long. So that each module finishes and a new one starts. So it's not repeating the same material. Makes sense. Okay. Um, how many different sites do you have throughout the county? Uh, so we only have one main site and it's in the city of Kenosha. Like that's where our literacy council is located. And then we have community partners where we might hold a class or, or some kind of programming. So we connect with the Boys and Girls Club and um, local schools and things like that to hold programming off-site. Um, but otherwise, we have one main location that we ask the majority of people to come to. So when we're talking about registration and orientation and things, it's all in this one general location. Okay, well, okay. questions for now. Awesome. Okay, so we're gonna go to our last section, um, which is reaching success, so the most exciting Yay. part. Um, and we, we, Cheryl had mentioned before that it's important to celebrate success, you know, multiple times. Um, and so we do so both uh, formally and informally. Um, so some of the things that we do that are kind of informal is um, whenever a student just comes to us and tells us about their experience uh, using the information they've learned in class in real life, um, we make sure we take a moment to celebrate and um, and just kind of acknowledge that that student is, is really making progress in their goals. And so for example, if, it, if they had just finished that public schools unit um, and then they went and they did their first parent-teacher conference all by the, like independently in English, Right? They come back and they tell us, and that's a moment to, to really celebrate. Um, and then we also, we have formal ways, right? So we, uh, 
acknowledge students with certificates and rewards when they complete a class. Um, and we will also celebrate with students if they've completed a level in their books and they're moving on to the next one. Um, and then another moment to celebrate with them is doing assessment and goal check-in. So we reassess our students every three months. Um, the assessment tool we use is Best Plus um, on, the, on the computer, so it's just a conversation test, in addition to some other assessments for reading and writing. Um, but that assessment we use because it's a, it's a good uh, way to, to gauge where the student is, it's accurate, um, and it only takes 10 to 15 minutes to do so. And so it's time effective, very time effective. It also lends itself as an opportunity to check in on, that, on the goal that they had set in a one-on-one -on -one, um, situation, right? So you have time to kind of discuss with that student where they are in their goals. Um, are they still interested in that same goal? Like, are they still aligned? with the programs that they're participating in? Um, do they have a new goal? Is there a new class that they should start thinking about? Um, and of course, it all depends on their test scores too. And what we found is that students, um, although a little hesitant, um, are excited about the assessment because they want to see that they're making progress. They want that accomplishment. Um, so those are just some of the ways that we do that. And then graduation, you can see a picture here of one of our graduations. Um, this is definitely our most formal way to celebrate student success. Um, and we invite all of our students, all of the volunteers, community members um, to come and join us in that celebration. Um, and then finally, kind of that final sign of success for a student is becoming a student on our student advisory committee. So members of this committee, it's, it's a mix. It's people who have um, been su successful, but are maybe still participating in our program. Um, they're definitely kind of at the higher end of it. And it's also people who have kind of moved on from our program, but want to stay involved in the Literacy Council. Um, so we, we rely on this group of people for multiple things. Um, first of all, program feedback. We ask them for their ideas about our current programming, um, but also future programming. So maybe they have ideas that we haven't thought of, um, or maybe we can bounce ideas off of them. Um, and they might, you know, they might design surveys or something like that, so that they're communicating with the students. Um, they're also our peer mentors. So these are the students that we ask to come and guest speak at that student orientation. Um, they, they will tell new learners about their experiences with us and kind of talk about where they were when they started and where they are now so that students can relate to them. Um, and they're, if they are still an active student, right, those new learners then can see them as a mentor and know that they're an experienced learner and go to them if they have any questions or concerns, if they do not yet feel comfortable to come ask me something. <laughs> um, uh, so just kind of giving them that, that shoulder of support. Um, and then these are also the students that we would call upon if we were going to be at a community event, right? So these are students that we would take with us to um, uh, to showcase their stories if, if we wanted them to connect with um, new supporters or, or community events that we hold. They're students that we can share their stories. Um, and then, of course, and finally, kind of circling us back to the recruitment and retention of new learners is they are the ones that um, are our greatest resource for the recruitment of new learners. They're the ones that go with us when we go to those open houses um, to talk with parents that might be interested in English classes. Um, they're the ones that come with us when we go to visit classes at our local technical college to guest speak about their experience with the Literacy Council. Um, and overall, they're, they're our greatest tool to advocate for the Literacy Council and recruit new learners. 
and that our drivers of persistence that we implemented in this part of their journey are a sense of belonging um, and clarity of purpose and competence. So, great. Another good spot to stop and see if there's questions, if you guys are interested in learning um, more about our advisory committee and how they work or how we utilize them to help with recruitment. Uh, we do have another question. Uh, how are you reaching your students during the stay at home orders due to COVID-19, especially the low literacy and low ELL students? It's a good transition. Um, so we're actually going to talk about that a little bit coming up. Um, so we'll hold on to that question. Um, and I had a question as well, and, and maybe this sure. is we'll be touching on a little bit later, but just in terms of your retention levels, can you speak to that a little bit? as to um, how many, what your average um, retention rates are and um, how many folks are achieving educational gains? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So based on um, standardized testing, as far as, I'll speak to the gains and, and Cassie can speak a little bit to retention. Um, but so we know that um, last year, 63% uh, of our students were able to increase one um, at least one education level based on those um, standardized tests. And then we also know in our ELL civics class, not only do we use those standardized tests, but we use smaller um, pre and post testing between modules. And so 75% of the learners that participated in that class improved their knowledge um, based on those pre and post tests. So just a little bit about gains of knowledge there, and then Cassie can talk a little bit about retention. Yeah, um, so since we've implemented the, the $20 deposit, um, we have seen a lot of growth in retention, um, and the mark is just at about 90% of completion for those classes, so. I, and I think that really speaks to, you know, students want their, their learning to be connected to their goals, um, and so by offering them those six to eight weeks, you're not committing them to a, an entire class. You're giving them those options. And I, most of the learners choose to continue with whatever program that they are in. But. Okay, well, those are, that's impressive data. You're way, way above the national averages there. So uh, congratulations on that. And I think that's all the questions we have for now. All right, so we're going to move on to how you all can implement this, some of what you've heard today in your program. And so normally this would be a fun kind of group conversation activity, but that's a little harder to do uh, in a virtual world. But we hope that you're going to participate a little bit using the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, if you have questions, if, and we want everyone to kind of take a second to think about something you heard today that you want to try. Um, and kind of comment on that so you can put it in the chat box. And then if there's um, questions about, hey, we want to try this, but I need a little more information or I need more details. Um, I know uh, from kind of past experience, some of the, the common things that come up with lots of questions are people are like, what about that Facebook thing? <laughs> uh, so we, uh, lots of questions about communication um, or how we kind of build those connections or bonds with the students. Um, the student advisory committee kind of getting that established. Um, so if y'all want to take a minute to think about something you want to try in your program and comment on the chat box and we can share some of that. We're counting on you to, to be brave today. <laughs> All right. So I'm very interested in the punch card incentive for attendance. Yeah, we, we are too. <laughs> um, uh, we were really surprised, I think. Not really surprised, but, but um, pleasantly surprised by how motivated the students were by that. We're like, hey, how about if we try this? This might be a cool, fun thing. And the students really took to it. And it's, it's super simple to get started, right? Can we just had the, we had cards printed um, that are just business cards, but it looks like a, a punch card, but you could certainly just photocopy something too. Um, and then it doesn't, it doesn't really cost us anything because the, the incentive that they get at the end is just kind of a, a coupon for their books. So <laughs> is that a fun, cool thing to try? 
Um, and also, I, so somebody said, I love how they pay the $20 deposit. It, that has really made a huge difference in our attendance. So Cassie mentioned in the programs where we are using that deposit system, the completion rate for those is 90%, which is amazing, right? <laughs> um, so it's really um, made a huge difference for us. I think the Facebook group for learners um, is nice. Uh, again, that's a really important way for us to communicate with our students and for them to, to get to know each other and communicate with each other too. Um, really like the deposit. <laughs> Lots of deposits and punch cards. Um, Yes, please, please take time to read the Making It Worth the Stay book. There's lots of great ideas and things you can take from your program. Um, what kind of incentives do you hand out? Um, so I'm not 100% sure. So for the punch card, the incentive is um, a coupon that they can use when they're purchasing their book. So it's like $5 off their next set of books. Um, some of our programs use some other incentives though too. So like our ELL civics program, I think Cassie might've mentioned that. Um, they're related to the topic that they're learning about. So if they're learning about healthcare, the incentive at the end uh, for perfect attendance might be a first aid kit. If they're learning about kind of safety and housing, then the incentive at the end might be a smoke detector. I don't know what are some other things you <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, it could be like school supplies or something that go along with the school unit. Um, another kind of unique thing that we, we've done is we've asked them um, if they would like to receive an incentive or we've done this like a restaurant thing where mm -hmm. we will, we'll take them out to a restaurant and we'll give them each you know, $5 towards their meal or something. And then they get to try a new place in the community and do something together. So they really like that too. I think it always depends on the personality of the class a little bit. Yeah, um, there's a question about the age range of our students. So all of our students are adults. We do have some family literacy programming, some workshops that are family literacy based, but all the students who are coming to our classes are adults. Um, most are kind of middle age range, right? So 25 to 45. <laughs> um, do you place the deposits in a bank account? We don't deposit the deposits uh, just because that's a, a little bit of a, an accounting nightmare. <laughs> So we uh, keep the deposits and we just, um, it's pretty, pretty low key. We have an envelope system. So the teacher for the class writes, you know, it has a thing printed on it where you keep track of who has paid the deposit and, and when and things like that. And then when, when we go to give it back, it also records that it's been given back to them. Um, and the teacher just keeps that, that envelope with the money. We don't have a budget for a literacy advocate, um, but it got me thinking about some of the classes that might be worthwhile. Um, so on the budget part of it, literacy advocate is an absolutely wonderful thing to write a grant for. <laughs> um, so uh, right, the idea that our students cannot learn and cannot meet their goals if they're their basic needs aren't met first, if they're hungry, if they're worried about how they're gonna pay their rent, if they're worried about how they're gonna get their kids medication, that's keeping them from learning. If they can't meet those basic life needs, they can't learn. Um, and so it's a really easy argument to make for a grant. So I would encourage you, if you think you don't have money to do it, uh, to consider writing a grant for that, to, to at least get it started. Um, but it's also something you could use a really well-trained volunteer for. So if you have a volunteer that works in the school as a social worker or has some kind of background like that, it would be a perfect opportunity to get them involved. So think about using a volunteer too. All right, um, I just wanna show you um, a resource. I think we're gonna show you a resource. So I'm one gonna, of the- I'm gonna stop share, okay? So one of the things we're going to give you or in the resources that you have after the session today is a document that's um, 
kind of a checklist, a self-assessment of your program that goes through um, the six drivers of persistence and, and how you can um, be using those in your program. So take a look at the resources afterwards <laughs> to find that document. Would you enroll a 16 year old or would a student have to be at least 18? So the vast majority of our students are 18, but we do occasionally make a exception to that rule. <laughs> uh, so if we have students who are here visiting family, for example, and they're just here for like the summer or they've already graduated in their own country because they often do that um, earlier, then we would allow that, that student who is maybe 16 or 17 to come study with us. Um, but for the most part, the general rule is if they are in the, our public school system, then we don't serve them in our program. So this is that self-assessment we're talking about. So you can find it in your materials for after the session. Um, and it will be a great way to think about what you're already doing in your program and what you might be able to do in the future. And then um, we're also going to move on a little bit and talk about COVID because I know that was one of the things people had questions on. And I don't want to miss out on that. Uh, so obviously, uh, things have changed a lot, very significantly in the last few months. So the way that our program, just real quick, um, has handled that is in March when we needed to close. So here in Wisconsin, that was about March 16th, that decision was made that the schools closed. Um, we immediately changed to virtual tutoring. Um, so within a week, we had never done any, <laughs> any virtual, any digital classes at all. And within a week, we had classes going on Zoom. Um, so we are, <laughs> you know, we really worked hard to get that going right away. We didn't want our students or our volunteers to kind of lose momentum. Um, and so we have been doing all of our classes on Zoom, and we've also been doing tutoring on Zoom. Of course, our attendance isn't the same as pre-Zoom, but we really worked with our students and our volunteers to make sure that they have the technology that they needed to be able to participate in classes if they wanted to. Um, so we were in a situation where we were able to provide them with tablets if they needed them. Um, and then our community has some resources that they could get internet access as well if they needed that. Um, but one of the reasons I feel like we have been so successful um, during this COVID time, and I really do feel like our program has been very successful in continuing learning, is because we've already established um, these really strong bonds with the students. And we already have kind of this really good communication system set up with them. Um, so that's a huge part of why we've been able to keep so many people actively engaged during COVID and we've been able to continue to communicate with them. Um, so I think these learners of persistence and the things that we already have established were really important um, as we transition to COVID um, and being able to communicate with the students using again those Facebook groups and Messenger and things like that. We've already kind of had those things established. Um, Carol, I, I had a quick question. I know yeah. most programs have have um, had a hit in their attendance because of COVID and the difficulties in transitioning over to distance learning. Um, mm -hmm. Just curious. I mean, you all do have very strong relationships. It sounds like with your students. Um, how you know what what have your levels been? How many students have you lost in that process in terms of sort of your regular attendance? Yeah, so we certainly have a few students who who aren't attending because they don't really like <laughs> the virtual tutoring or um, and a few that just didn't didn't have the, the skills and things. Um, but the vast majority of our students transition to virtual tutoring and most of them have stuck with it. Um, and we are um, now getting to the point where we're going to um, start to do some in person classes again and so we'll uh, get get back with those students who maybe decided virtual learning wasn't <laughs> for them. Um, but even if they they weren't doing classes, we kept in touch with them. Okay, very good. Well, we're we're at the end of our uh, seventy five minutes. Um, I want to thank both of you. You've, you, I mean, you share so much great information, uh, strategies, ideas here. Uh, that there's a lot of takeaways and uh, really. Appreciate learning more about what you're doing there in Kenosha. So, Very good. Um, 
So I just wanted to mention quick to go back to the COVID. Um, in your resources, we included uh, an article from um, the Chicago Tribune um, about a high school in Chicago that really um, focused on relationships and use those relationships to engage their students during COVID. Um, and so I think it's a great resource. Uh, so take a look at that article. And then um, on the screen, you can see our email addresses. We'd love to talk with any of you. you know, send us a message um, if you have questions or want more information about anything. I know one of the resources we sometimes share is our um, like a student guide <laughs> that we give out at the, the orientation, so our student handbook. Sorry, <laughs> the word escaped me. Um, and then also check us out on Facebook. So we are a public Facebook page and we post lots of different things about our programming and photos and things so you can see, see lots of what we're up to there. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for all the great resources. Uh, please do um, complete the evaluation that should come up at the, when you uh, exit this, um, this session. Your feedback is very much appreciated. And, and have a good afternoon. Thank you all. Hey, take care. Have a good afternoon.